Thank you. Please be seated. We are back on the record in the matter of State of Utah versus Martin Joseph McNeil. The jury is seated. Mr. McNeil is present with his counsel. The state's attorneys are present. Mr. Spencer, you may close. May it please the court and counsel and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be with you participating in, in our justice system. And I'm grateful for your attention during this trial and, and hope that, uh, uh, that, that actually both of our efforts, we, we've endeavored to, to represent our positions, I believe, in, in as effective a manner as possible and hope that I, I hope that I haven't done anything in, a, in, in any way that would have been offensive. It certainly wasn't my intent. Um, uh, I'm grateful now to have the opportunity to, to talk to you about the evidence. I, you've heard a story uh, today from the prosecution, and they've talked about uh, uh, some of the facts. As Ms. Gustin mentioned in her opening statement, uh, the prosecution continues to, to cherry-pick the facts that support their perspective uh, of the evidence. Uh, when I was uh, just a, a very young lad, uh, my mother, who was frustrated for for being unfairly judged for marrying a man who wasn't a member of the prominent religion, she taught me Aesop's fables. I can remember it like it was yesterday. She taught me the, the lessons of the fable about the farmer and the serpent and how the farmer went out, went out into the field to work and when he returned to his house, he found circumstances that he immediately perceived to be consistent with the conclusion that he thought was accurate. And he acted upon uh, that perception only to later learn that that perception was wrong and that what he thought was the accurate interpretation of the circumstances was completely different. But it was too late. My mother also taught me uh, idioms such as don't judge a book by its cover. This is a case where, where those principles are very applicable. My client Martin McNeil was living in an alternative lifestyle. There's no, no dispute to that. And Gypsy Willis wasn't his first affair. He was living a lifestyle where he had his, his so-called perfect family, his wife and kids, beautiful wife, as, as you've seen. And separate from that, he was maintaining a, a mistress on the side. Had done that uh, not only with Gypsis, but also Gypsy, uh, but also with uh, Anna Osborne in the past. <clears throat> when Michelle passed away, is it so surprising that, that Martin would seek to, to move his mistress into a more prominent role in his life? Is it so surprising that he would seek to do that in a way that would be most palatable or acceptable to his children? Referring to the, to the temple incident, trying to smooth things out as, as easily as he could? <clears throat> These are all circumstances. The, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Not all circumstances are circumstantial evidence. Judge Poland has defined for you what circumstantial evidence is. And in the instructions, he, <clears throat> he used an example. Circumstantial evidence is a scenario where, for example, if someone were to look out a window and see that the ground is wet and people are putting down umbrellas, it would be reasonable, reasonable to infer from those circumstances that it had just rained. There's a, a direct correlation from what you see and, and only one reasonable inference. The circumstances that the prosecution has presented to you today have multiple reasonable interpretations. A few are, are consistent with, with their perception of, of homicide. There are perceptions or, or reasonable interpretations of, of that circumstantial evidence consistent with a man trying to, to cover up his alternative lifestyle. There are reasonable interpretations of, of all the circumstances consistent with an odd and an eccentric man, generally. I submit to you that none of the circumstances that the prosecution has submitted to you is consistent with homicide without a real possibility of other circumstances also being consistent. 
They don't rise to the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. All of the evidence which you hear in this case must be filtered through the proof beyond a reasonable doubt filter. That is the way our judicial system is designed. And it serves a very important purpose so that we don't have people who are in the wrong place at the wrong time or who do things that may look them, make them look guilty, but they are not. So we don't have those people convicted. That is what we have here, too. Martin McNeil did not kill us all. It makes no sense that he would. All the evidence which you hear must be filtered through the principles of, of our judicial system, including that the prosecution has the burden of proof, that anybody charged with the crime, including Mr. McNeil, is presumed innocent, and that the only way anybody can be convicted of a crime in our system is if there is proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Anything less than that requires you as jurors to exercise your duty in finding my client, Mr. McNeil, in this case, not guilty. So, for example, if in consideration of all of the evidence in, in this case, you find that he absolutely did not uh, commit this crime, you must find him not guilty. If in consideration of all the evidence you believe that, that his guilt is highly unlikely, you must find him not guilty. If you believe that in consideration of the evidence that his guilt is unlikely, you must find him not guilty. If you believe he's probably not guilty, you must find him not guilty. If you suspect that he might be guilty, you still must find him not guilty. If you believe he's probably guilty, this is the civil standard that is this reference in the instructions that we use in, in most every other case that goes through the judicial system other than criminal cases, it's more likely than not, or, or preponderance of the evidence. If you believe that there is a preponderance of the evidence that he's probably guilty, in criminal cases, you still must find him not guilty. That's your duty. Another civil standard, clear and convincing evidence of guilt. If you believe that the evidence in this case and, and reasonable circumstances, that there are reasonable conclusions that you think can be drawn from circumstantial evidence, rise to the level of, of only clear and convincing evidence, or too clear and convincing evidence of guilt, but not beyond, you still must find him not guilty. That, that's our system. Even if you believe that the reasonable inferences from circumstances rise to the level that you believe guilt is highly likely, but there remains a real possibility that he's not guilty. You must find him not guilty. That's our system. Applying the burden of proof, the presumption of innocence, and the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt as your duty as jurors to do. There is not evidence in this case that rises to the level of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt with no real possibility of innocence. It's simply not there. The prosecution has presented to you their, their cherry-picked versions of the evidence of, of portions of evidence that is most consistent with their theories, and they have not argued to you the, the numerous uh, items of, of testimony or, or evidence that was submitted in this case that are inconsistent not the least of which is the testimony from the medical examiners. Medical examiners who told you that their duty uh, is to evaluate the evidence in the case, not just the evidence from the autopsy, but also investigatory information, and make conclusions regarding both the cause and the manner of death. The Utah State Medical Examiner, Dr. Fricke, is not a hired expert, either by the prosecution or the defense, but is an independent state agency. She, she performed the initial autopsy. Dr. Gray testified that he saw nothing in there to indicate that, that my client, Mr. McNeil, um, did anything to interfere with the autopsy. And, and of course, a, a reputable medical examiner like Dr. Fricke would not allow that to happen. It was, uh, she conducted her her examination, as you will see in, in her notes, with the knowledge that some family members, specifically Linda Clough, uh, thought that Martin had killed Michelle. So it's not like Dr. Fricke had no clue about some of the family members' assertions. 
she evaluated the evidence fairly and she made a conclusion. She certified the cause of death as being due to hypertension, cardio or cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and myocarditis. And she certified the cause of death as being natural. That's a real possibility of innocence. But that's reasonable doubt. Beyond that, we have Dr. Gray. In 2008, uh, he was approached by the investigators in this case. They gave him, as he described it, oodles of information. He reviewed the oodles of information that he was given. And after reviewing that information and reviewing Dr. Fricke's reports, he sent them back the email that, that we discussed in opening statement as well as during his testimony, where he said that upon reviewing everything, he believes Dr. Fricke was right, that there's ample evidence of death by natural disease process, and that he doesn't see evidence of drowning, and that the medications are low and not consistent in his mind uh, with somebody trying to, to over-medicate somebody and cause death. And that was in September of 2008. Dr. Gray then testified that over the next two years, he was contacted numerous times by the the investigators again. They were asking to change his opinion. You heard evidence from, from a number of witnesses that the investigators said that they were trying to get around the medical examiner's opinion, both Dr. Fricke's original opinion and Dr. Gray's September 2008 opinion. And in the process of trying to get around the medical examiner's opinion, they continued to work on Dr. Gray as well. And finally, in October of 2010, they persuaded Dr. Gray to amend his opinion a little bit. He did not change the, the actual cause of death. He still said that the cause of death was cardiovascular disease due to <clears throat> hypertension and myocarditis. He added to that that drug toxicity, in other words, the medications that were in her system, may have contributed to a terminal cardiac arrhythmia due to the cardio underlying cardiovascular disease. You'll see in his report, uh, as you get back to the jury room and review the evidence, that his language in the amendment was very carefully worded. And in relation to the drugs, he said, they could potentially have had an effect. They may have had an effect. That's reasonable doubt. Even after he was persuaded to amend uh, the uh, official autopsy certification a little bit, he still found that the manner of death was undetermined, meaning that when he reviewed all of the investigatory information that he was given, and when he re-reviewed uh, the autopsy, and as he testified, as he thought about the, the, the drug levels again, he thought, boy, that ought to be included in, in the certification. And so, so even after he did all that, he could not conclude this was a homicide. And that's exactly what he said on the stand is it based upon all of the evidence that, that he had been presented without the benefit of cross-examination, mind you. I hope that, if nothing else, some of my efforts during, during this case has showed you that, that much of the evidence that the investigators were presenting uh, was, was not quite what it appeared to be. But there were many inconsistencies and problems and variations and evolutions possibly fabrications, certainly changes in perceptions of the evidence. But the medical examiners, they didn't have a benefit of cross-examination when they, they found their opinions. They, they accepted, or at least had, all of the investigative materials before them just to, to read. And Dr. Gray could not conclude it was a homicide. Not in October of 2010, and not in October of 2013. So then the state hires Nancy Grace's expert, Dr. Perper. They hire an expert whose opinion they already know because he's portrayed it to the world by Nancy Grace, and they already know that he has disputed uh, or, or disagrees with the opinion of the Utah State Medical Examiners, both of them. And, and they hire him to review, supposedly do an independent review, of the Utah State Medical Examiner's opinions when they already know what he thinks. Is it any surprise that 
that he again in his report came back and said, I think Michelle drowned? No, it's no surprise. That's what he already said. As he stated on the stand in his report, he said nothing about this delusional theory that, that he testified to at trial. That was new material after the, the, the discussion of the preliminary hearing in this case. And it wasn't credible information either. Uh, we submitted an exhibit of, it's exhibit 8A, uh, which is the, the lab results uh, from Michelle McNeil's some blood testing, both on April 11th of 2007, as well as um, it, here it says the reporting date uh, as March 30th, but it was from Dr. Welch's testing on March 29th of 2007. And you can see the comparisons. It doesn't take a, a medical scientist to go through and recognize that there's not a representation of 50% dilution in these labs. It's, it's pretty simple mathematics. Some levels are higher, some levels are lower. And in relation to the 411 labs, the other thing that we know is that they were drawn during the time that Michelle was, was CPR was being performed on her and had been performed on her for a long time. As Dr. Gray testified, post-mortem blood work is, is not reliable. And so for Dr. Perper to, to come and take this post-mortem blood work and say, this is 100% evidence of dilution is just not credible. Nor is it credible that the lab would be able to, to give uh, results with blood that supposedly was 50% diluted. It doesn't work that way. If it did work that way, the reports on here that were higher would be 50% higher still. And so you, you take a look at her, her liver tests on the lab, her ALT and AST. Those are exponentially higher than they were when she was tested on March 29th of 2007. If this blood represents 50% dilution, this would be much higher as well. Similar with her creatinine. Chloride is a good example. Chloride is, is one that, uh, uh, that Dr. Perper, I, I, don't, I don't recall him mentioning. Uh, chloride is, is just about the same certainly doesn't represent a 50% dilution, the difference between 100 and 102. The lab work doesn't support the reason. Now, as you saw, I, I cross-examined Dr. Perper fairly extensively. Not because the cause of death of drowning is, is so significant, but because of the fact that he was trying to rely on science that is not nearly as credible as he was making it out to be. Dr. Gray testified about that. Dr. Gray testified that, that both he and Dr. Fricky had examined the lung slides, and they were not consistent with somebody who had ingested substantial amounts of water. Dr. Gray is not the hired expert for anybody. He's calling it the way he sees it because that's his job. And all three of the medical examiners have a duty uh, to, to determine the manner of death. And none of them could conclude that this was a homicide. That's reasonable doubt. If medical examiners can review all of this information and cannot conclude that it's a homicide, then how could you as jurors look at all this information as well, even with the benefit of cross-examination, and conclude differently from that? It's certainly your province to do so. I don't mean to be suggesting that, that it's not. You, you are the ultimate finders of fact in this case. But you do have the obligation to consider the evidence. And I submit to you that however you look at it, the medical examiner testimony supports reasonable doubt. And therefore, the only just verdict at the end of the day in this case is not guilty on both counts. I feel like I could sit down right now because the medical examiner testimony is so clear. 
but I am a lawyer, and so I can't bring myself to do that, fearing that, that you may have some other questions. The truth of the matter is that I wish that I could stand here and, and, and we could do a question and answer type of a, of a dialogue, uh, but that, that's not quite the way it works. And so I'm going to talk about some other facts, uh, and, and hopefully they will address some of the questions that you have, particularly in light of, of uh, the prosecution statements. One of the... Well, maybe before I do that, I also want to... Just bring it back out the, the chart that I showed you in in, um, in opening, and um, with all of the uh, uh, the medical examiner testimony, and they, they diverge in some ways. Uh, we have Dr. Fricky in 2007, and and then Dr. Gray in 2008 when he was in total agreement with with her, and then we have Dr. Gray with his amendment in 2010, and then Dr. Perper in his opinion initially in 2012. There is one commonality that, uh, uh, to, to use Mr. Greenander's phrase, drips from the pages. And that commonality is terminal cardiac arrhythmia secondary to hypertensive cardiovascular disease. All three of them found that that, that was a significant finding on autopsy. Dr. Fricky and Dr. Gray found that that was the mechanism of death related to the cause being cardiovascular disease. Dr. Perper found that the findings in relation to hypertensive changes in Michelle's body were significant enough that he believed that that may have contributed to her drowning. In other words, caused her to fall into the tub. That's reasonable doubt. So what were the terminal well, what were the changes that, uh, that led to a terminal cardiac arrhythmia secondary to a hypertensive cardiovascular disease an enlarged heart, for one? There was what, what was described as left ventricular hypertrophy, or narrowing of the left ventricle, narrowing of the ostium, or, or the coronary artery. These are all independent factors that increase a person's risk of an arrhythmia. Uh, there was some... Um, fatty liver disease, which Dr. Gray testified about, would increase one's risk of, an, of, of arrhythmia. There is also the prolonged uh, QT syndrome that we talked a, a fair amount about. All of those factors increased Michelle's risk of arrhythmia. All of those factors led the three medical examiners to have this common conclusion. That's a real possibility that Martin McNeil did not kill his wife. That's reasonable doubt. That requires you in exercising your duty to find him not guilty. Beyond the findings in the heart, what else did Dr. Perper find? He, he found that uh, the medical examiner's uh, opinion, uh, Dr. Fricky's opinion in relation to the kidney, didn't go far enough in identifying hypertensive changes. He found that, uh, that Dr. Fricky's opinion in relation to the fatty liver didn't go far enough. That he found even more changes in the liver. As Dr. Gray said in, in his uh, September 2008 email, that there's abundant evidence of natural disease process that reasonably would lead to death. August of 2013, after both Dr. Gray and Dr. Perper have been presented with additional investigatory information after the inmates have been interviewed. They reviewed that, that additional investigatory information. Dr. Gray sent an email, which we discussed during the trial. And in that email, he said, while the inmate testimony, he didn't use the inmate testimony, he used additional information. While the additional information may increase suspicion, in his opinion, it doesn't overcome the natural evidence of disease of leading to death. And he again comments that the levels of medications are relatively low. That's reasonable doubt from the medical professionals that, that are trained in, in interpreting this type of evidence. The prosecution is, is wanting to, to jump from one of the steps of the medical examiner 
and, and, and have you ignore their opinions to a degree. As Dr. Gray testified, it is the medical examiner's job to, to determine whether or not somebody died due to a homicide, but it is not the medical examiner's job to determine who committed the homicide. It, that, that's, that would be your job. And so if Dr. Gray, Dr. Fricky, or Dr. Perper had determined that there had been a homicide, they would have come to, to court and they would have testified that they believed that, that Michelle died from due to a homicide, and then you would have had the obligation to determine who committed it. Well, in this particular case, they, they don't even get to first base because the medical examiners couldn't conclude that it was a homicide. Before we go on, let's talk a little bit about medications. Now, that's been a big deal in, in the trial. And, and it's been described by the prosecution as, as, a, as a potent cocktail. First of all, there is not a single bit of credible evidence that anybody other than Michelle McNeil administered medications to her that morning. I mean, think about it. The only potential evidence of anybody other than Michelle McNeil giving her medications would be inmate number one's testimony. And as Mr. Brunander explained to you today, inmate number one testified that, that, uh, that Martin McNeil gave her oxys in court. In, in his original statement, he said that uh, it was oxycontin, uh, which although has the same underlying drug, is different than, than oxycodone. And he testified that he knew the difference, but in his original statement, uh, he, he used over and over oxycontin. He said they loaded her up on oxycontin. And when that didn't work, he gave her some more. This is a perfect example of how the prosecution is cherry picking information. They want to use inmate number one's unreliable and uncredible testimony to assert that Martin McNeil gave. Michelle medications on April 11th without any other evidence to, to support it. And then they want you to ignore that portion of Alexis's testimony that was that Michelle did not want to take any medications from Martin and insisted on Alexis giving her medications because she was supposedly afraid. See what I mean? Prosecution, they, 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 they just want to take the pieces of the evidence that supports their case and ignore those that, that don't. I submit to you that neither Alexis nor inmate number one's testimony is credible at either rate, um, but that there's, there's simply no evidence that, that um, Martin gave Michelle any medication on April 11th, and there's no evidence that she would have taken it from him if he had. Inmate number one's testimony is, is actually quite consistent with Alexis, Alexis's version of what she claims happened on April 4th and 5th, what we loosely refer to as the alleged over-medication incident. Michelle didn't have bandages on her eyes on April 11th, right? On April 4th and 5th, she did. So what do you think inmate number one was, was referring to? It wasn't April 11th. He was referring to the story that he heard about Alexis's over-medication incident. He was referring to Alexis's story about Martin allegedly over-medicating her on the 5th. There's no evidence that he did anything on, on the 11th. He was referring to the story that he hears about, about uh, Dr. Perper's opinion of drowning as, as it uh, was on Nancy Grace. He was referring to, to stories that he they heard about uh, about this fairy tales and family strife. The the prosecution wants you to rely on inmate number one's testimony that Michelle was planning to divorce Martin, <coughs> and even Alexis didn't say that. The most that Alexis said was that that there was this fight that supposedly occurred on, on April 8th, which was another evolution of her testimony. Not something that was there at the beginning, but something that, that evolved and was woven in later. 
I got a little sidetracked from where I started, didn't I? Um, uh, but uh, uh, the point was in relation to the medication that there, there's, there's no evidence uh, on April 11th, 2007, that is credible that, that Martin you know, gave Michelle medication and, and no evidence that she would have taken it from him if he did. And even if he did, hypothetically, the medications were, were low. They were very low. They were low enough that Dr. Perper said that he doubts they would cause impairment. Another example of the cherry picking of the prosecution in this case. They wanted to take Dr. Perper's opinion uh, in relation to drowning, but ignore his opinion in relation to the medications. So Dr. Perper doubts that the medications would, uh, would cause impairment. Uh, Dr. Gray, when he amends his opinion, says that they could, could potentially have, have caused impairment. Dr. Dawson testified uh, that uh, he thinks that they could have left Michelle significantly obtunded. But then I cross-examined him about his original interview where he said, there's no smoking gun here with the toxicology. There's no toxicology. There's nothing here that you wouldn't expect to see from somebody who, who was prescribed these medications. Take a really good prosecutor to prove this case because there's no toxicology. You remember all that testimony. And then we have Dr. Thompson, another doctor, another doctor whose testimony the prosecution wants to ignore. Remember what he said about the medication? He said, even if somebody took it all, even if somebody took all of it at the same time, he wouldn't expect it to, to cause any problems because we give this medication in the hospital all the time. And in fact, if you look at his records, At the end, you'll see that uh, the prescriptions that, that he gave for Michelle to take in the hospital included morphine every two hours, Vicodin, which you heard testimony about as Lortab, every four hours, and Tylenol, Tylenol 650 every four hours, and then Ambien at night, and then Zofran and other anti-nausea. So even in the hospital, Dr. Thompson prescribe a similar, as a prosecution would term, cocktail of medications. Dr. Dawson testified about the ambient, ambient in, in his initial interview that that level was low, fairly low. Doesn't know whether it would make any difference or not. All the levels that we have are not even considering the, the now well-recognized principle of post-mortem redistribution. The prosecution tried to counter post-mortem redistribution by coming up after the preliminary hearing with this, this dilution theory. But even, remember we did that chart, and I'm not a very good artist, but I tried to explain it to you. Uh, we, we did the chart about comparing dilution and postmortem redistribution. Even if we take the highest levels of potential dilution, of 50%, which isn't supported by the evidence, but, but even if we use that, that is so much smaller than the likely effect of postmortem redistribution. In other words, 50% as compared to a 200 or 50% uh, decrease pursuant to dilution, is what they would argue, as compared to a 200, 300, 400, 500, or 600% increase in medications as a result of postmortem redistribution. Postmortem redistribution would occur after the blood has already been allegedly diluted because that occurs after death when it starts to, to leach out of the tissues that, that are around the, the heart. And, and so the drug exits the tissue and re-enters the bloodstream, causing these, these dramatic increases. Even with the Ambien, we had the one study that, that was up to a 3.75 ratio from, from heart blood to peripheral, which in, in peripherals, Dr. Gray testified, isn't even necessarily accurate either, but it's believed to be closer to conditions prior to death, certainly than, than heart blood. But, but Ambien would potentially have a nearly a 400% potential increase. Oxycodone, up to a 600% potential increase. Phenergan, ironically, during the trial, we learned wasn't as significant as people thought before and learned that the lab results only meant detected and not an approximate level. 
uh, that also, you heard testimony from Dr. Dawson particularly, had a significant um, um, postmortem redistribution factor. And then oxy, you know, we hit oxycodone, and then, then diazepam. We heard testimony that diazepam uh, has been seen in studies to have up to a 1,200% increase after death. As Dr. Gray testified, no reliable conclusions can be made due to postmortem heart blood. But even if we throw out postmortem redistribution, and, and throw out dilution too for that matter, the levels that were measured of medication in Michelle's blood were all therapeutic. They were not consistent with an overdose. And consistent with Dr. Perper's testimony, he doubts that they would cause impairment. Dr. Gray <coughs> thinks they could potentially have caused impairment or unconsciousness, I think, were his words. Dr. Dawson, after being asked by the prosecution for ways to get around the medical examiner's opinion, and after he said that there's no smoking gun here, no toxicology, ultimately uh, gave his opinion that, that the medications could have led to her being obtained. Is there reasonable doubt in relation to the medications? Is there a real possibility that the prosecution's evidence in relation to the medications contributing to death is inaccurate? Yes, there is. That requires you in relation to that. To to not, you can't rely on that as, as a basis to support a foundation of, of a potential uh, verdict based upon proof beyond a reasonable doubt because that evidence is unreliable. There's a real possibility that it's not right. You must find the point that case. A lot more that could be said about the, the, the medication, I suppose, but I, I think you understand it. And, no, I'll we'll move on. There's lots of other evidence in this case that, that was presented from non-expert testimony. You heard it. You heard the inconsistencies. I'll come back. You heard the, the evolution of perceptions. I want to take you back to what I think is probably the most credible evidence uh, in relation to what really may have um, been going on on April 11th of 2007. And there's some, some notes. This is an exhibit, and so you'll be able to, to see it. But Dr. Fricky has some, some notes in, in her uh, report. And, uh, and maybe before I get there, I'll just briefly review some of the things that we talked about. This is the first page of the autopsy report. You'll see that Dr. Fricky's primary finding of cardiovascular disease is hypertension. Myocarditis is, is third. I think I forgot to mention that as a potential increased risk of arrhythmia, but, um, but it's disputed, so I kind of haven't been focused on that. Dr. Fricky's main finding is hypertension, and then hypertrophy of the left ventricle. Oh, I didn't, I didn't mention scarring either. That, that's another factor, that, that uh, the interstitial fibrosis that increases Michelle's risk for, for an arrhythmia. Renal arterial sclerosis. That's the kidney. This is the atherosclerosis, stenosis of the osteum and the coronary artery. Then myocarditis, fatty liver. And then she discusses the surgery. She obviously recognized the medications. She too was, was under the misunderstanding in relation to promethazine back then. But then she also finds, and Dr. Perper, as you remember, argued with me about this, he, he found that, that, that Michelle was constipated secondary to medications and relative immobilization. If you look through her whole report, you'll see that she's, she found a large amount of very firm fecal matter in the colon. So the autopsy report is clear that she found that Michelle was very constipated. And then we'll talk a little bit about the potential significance of that later. So in addition to her typed up report, she took some notes. handwritten notes that are in her, in her report. And as you go through her notes, you'll see that uh, she had a pattern of when she was taking notes in relation to the autopsy, that uh, she would um, write down the name of the person to whom she was speaking. The evidence is undisputed in this case that uh, when there was a conversation on April 12th of 2007, that it was on speakerphone, and both 
uh, Martin and, and Michelle, uh, Martin and Alexis participate. Dr. Fricky notes Alexis's name. Clearly, Alexis is, is participating. And she goes through. The daughter is a first year medical student. Goes through some of these things that we discussed. Percocet, used sparse three to four a day. The first dispense was used, second one not used. No history of narcotics use. Again, that's consistent with Alexis's knowledge. Rare migraines, had seen the MD the day before, taken Keflex post op. Saw Dr. Welch, Dr. Thompson, plastic surgery. I hope you guys can see this on the back row. And so, so down here, there's a discussion. Mild respiratory distress, night after surgery, decreased the amount of narcotics, Percocet. And so, whether Martin said that, or whether Alexis said that, Alexis would have heard it, but there's actually evidence of who said it. Family dispensed narcotics until day six. What's the significance of day six? That's Alexis's terminology. In the Zyrtec notebook that, that you'll see, she has day two, day three, day four, day five. Family dispensed the medication until day six, when Michelle started doing it herself. The, the two notebooks that Alexis testified about, that's another evolution of fact that didn't come about until, until her story evolved through the years. But we've talked about circumstantial evidence. This is circumstantial evidence from which a reasonable conclusion can be made that this was the initial version of Alexis's story about the over overmedication. Let's talk about some other circumstantial evidence if we want to believe Alexis's testimony. She said that as of April 11, 2007, she believed that Martin had killed Michelle, right? Remember that testimony? If she believe that, and if she heard Martin allegedly downplay that over-medication incident like this, don't you think that she would have either said something then to Dr. Fricky or contacted Dr. Fricky later and corrected the versions? Because she believes that, that Martin killed Michelle? Is she really going to let the medical examiner not have all accurate information? Of course she would. You, you saw her on the 2020 that we played. The number one, it was different than her version of, of, of the over-medication incident because on 2020 she said that she went in and saw her mother and her mother was sedated and she said, Mom, what happened to you? And Mom said that your dad kept giving me medication and so I went right to talk to my dad. On the 2020 incident she describes a very cause and effect type of, of a interaction on that morning, which is different than the testimony that she gave in court which was that mom didn't tell her that until the preliminary hearing. It was later in the evening in court. It was sometime during, during the day. But that is more circumstantial evidence to, to lead to the conclusion that these are Lexus's words. And there's more. So on the next page, at home, were massaging her legs. Whose words were those? Those were Alexis's, weren't they? Making her walk. Whose words were those? Those were Alexis's. You heard them. A.M. of death. She was helping get younger children ready for school. Whose words were those? They were Alexis's, weren't they? She was feeling a little sick. Feeling a little sick. Whose words were those? Not during court, but during the funeral. That's an exact quote from Alexis's funeral talk. She was feeling a little sick on the morning of her death. 
But what does Alexis testify to in court? Mom is doing just great. She's up, up and about doing laundry, getting the kids ready for school, going to pick up Ada from school. She's, she's going to take the girls to ballet. And yet, back on April 12th of 2007, Dr. Fricky records Alexis's words. This is powerful circumstantial evidence from which the conclusion can be drawn that this was Alexis saying this. And even if it wasn't, it was her listening to it. She's feeling a little sick and planning to return to bed. If Michelle was feeling a little sick and planning to return to bed, on the morning of April 11th of 2007, isn't it also reasonable to, to conclude that she may have decided to take some medication herself? Not an overdose, mind you. Nobody thinks that, at least from a defense point of view, nobody thinks that there was an overdose. But it is certainly reasonable to conclude that, that she would voluntarily have, have taken some medication that morning. Ambient, she probably took the night before. Blood pressure slightly elevated, not taking blood pressure meds, second degree nausea. Again, all likely coming from, from Alexis. And down here we get to talking about eye drops, prednisone eye drops, four hours. And he was administering them. Nothing about him administering anything other than an eye drops. Percocet, one to two, and then and we go on to, to more of those ones. Rarely used, or except rarely used to use only one hand. Again, that, those are Alexis's words. He was monitoring her heart rate. And you can, this is all an exhibit, so you'll be able to review it more if, if you like. And we get on to the day of death, alone about two hours. It goes through to the schedule. The documentation on April 12th, as well as the statements made at the funeral on April 14th, are the most credible evidence of what really was going on at that time, as opposed to the evolution of perceptions that occurred over the next five months until Alexis made her first official statement in September, and then over the next three, four, five years as things continue to evolve. It's reasonable doubt. What can you trust in the testimony of Alexis Summers? Rachel McNeil, similar. Her testimony evolves over time, too. Facts get uh, more and more slanted towards making her father out to, to be a bad guy. Starts to emphasize this autopsy statement that, that she says that came up uh, you know, most significantly shortly before the preliminary hearing. And, and now, for the first time at trial, she's saying, Dad was saying it all the time, over and over. Which nobody else says that. Even Alexis doesn't say that. And then Rachel, at the trial, you heard her say that uh, the dad was, he was just, he kept wanting to show us what happened. Remember that? What did Alexis say about the, the description of what happened in the tub? Alexis said that I asked my dad to show me what happened. Soon after I got home, and then, although it's another evolution, she says, then I asked again when Rachel got home. Rachel and Alexis's testimony is not consistent, and I submit neither of their testimony is credible anyway. There's a lot more things that, that I could um, point out uh, in relation to the inconsistencies of, of both Alexis and Rachel, but I believe that, that you heard him in, in our cross-examination, and, uh, and we'll have them in your notes. Now I'd like to go over with you 
the timeline based upon the evidence that, that we've heard. So on April 11th of 2007, in the morning, uh, we know that between 7.30 and 8.30, Martin takes uh, Sabrina, Al, and Ada to school. Okay. We know from Alexis's testimony and also the phone records uh, that there was a phone call from Alexis to the <coughs> Michelle's cell phone, or I'm sorry, to the house phone uh, at 8.41, and Alexis had testified in the past, and she affirmed it in court, that there was no answer on that call. At 8.44, Michelle calls Alexis back from Michelle's cell phone to Alexis's cell phone. And interestingly, if you look at the records, uh, for some reason it comes up blocked uh, from Michelle's phone to, to Alexis's. Uh, and so if you look on Alexis's records, it'll show as a blocked call, but if you look on Michelle's, you'll see who, who she called. And it's curious why why Michelle would block it that morning, too, because just the night before, there were calls that show up on both of the phone records. Probably doesn't make a difference to the price of tea in China, but interesting. And so at 9.10, Martin calls from his office phone to Alexis's cell phone, shows up as a two-minute call on Alexis's records, a 66-second call on Martin's work phone records. Alexis claims that that was a voicemail, might have long voicemail if it was, but it could have been. 917, Martin calls Michelle's cell phone for 36 seconds. 926, and, and this is uh, from Martin's work phone. 926, Martin calls from his office phone to Gypsy's phone. He also called her up, up here in the morning, too. Strange thing to do for somebody who allegedly is planning to kill his wife on um, on a particular day to, to be making clearly traceable calls to, to his mistress. 9.30, when Alexis says that she was in, um, uh, in her neurology lecture, she has a seven-minute call to customer service, T-Mobile. Sometime between 10.40 and 10.50, Melissa Frost says she got a call from Josette Harding stating that Martin is ready to receive the award. Well, if you look at Martin's phone records that, that are in there, there's no record of him calling back to the developmental center during, you know, the, the, the 9 to 12 o'clock hour. How did Josette Hardy know that Martin was ready to, to receive the award? Reasonable that Martin had to be there, right? Nobody at the developmental center and nobody in the neighborhood saw Martin running back and forth in, in the morning of, of April 11th, consistent with the prosecution's plan that he, he went out to, to kill Michelle sometime between 9.30 and 11. So circumstantially, it's very reasonable to infer from the evidence that we have that Martin must have been there to tell Josette Harding that he was ready to get the award to call Melissa Frost. 10.50 a.m., Utah time, these are all Utah time, Alexis calls from her cell phone to the house phone. She uh, testified during trial that nobody answered. But remember the two emails that, that I showed you, uh, showed her, uh, one from uh, September 14th and the other one from the 23rd, I think, or, two emails in September, both times. She said that she knows that she called and talked to her mother around 10.30 Utah time. Not surprisingly, there, there's a call at 10.50, pretty close to around 10.30 Utah time. In other statements that, that Alexis had made, uh, that, that we discussed during her cross-examination, she said that when she got this voicemail from her father, that it was just weird, and so she repeatedly called her mother, both on the cell phone and on the house phone, multiple times to see what's going on. Well, look at her cell phone records. It's not there. Remember I questioned her about that? Do you remember her answer? Well, we didn't have an answering machine then. Remember that? Well, if if her, if her multiple phone calls when she's concerned about her dad's voicemail, 
wouldn't show up on, on the answering machine or voicemail? How did this call that was a no answer show up on Alexis's phone records? How did this call that she says was a no answer show up on her phone records? <coughs> Obviously they had voicemail. If Alexis was so concerned after getting this, uh, what she says was a voicemail from Martin at 9.10 that she called her mother multiple times on both the, the cell phone and the house phone, we would have records of it in the film. She's, her story has evolved. Her perceptions have changed. Her perceptions are incorrect. You turn over the crib and you see the truth. Alexis' story in court was not accurate. Eleven AM. Martin calls Quest from his office phone. Six minutes. Something else that seems a little odd for somebody to do when the state thinks that there's this grand scheme to, to kill Michelle on this day. So so he's gonna go to his office and at a time where he easily could have another alibi at the, at the safety pair, but he's gonna go to his office and talk to Quest for six minutes. And so then, after that, he walks over to the, the Heather building, as Jim Van Zandt testified, and I think, um, I think Roman Henry's testimony was about the same too, about a two and a half minute walk. Arrives at the safety fair, Roma Henry says that when he arrived, he says, okay, let's, let's get this done, and everybody had to scramble. Roma Henry and Melissa Frost say that the word was given after 11 a.m., and, and even the prosecution conceded in their, their closing argument that the uh, would have been after this, this phone call. Melissa Frost says that the, the whole thing, that Martin was there for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then she was mad because after she'd hurried to put all this together, remember what she said he did? He stayed around and visited with vendors. So somebody who was supposedly in this rush, setting up to maybe go back and forth to, to um, as, as they perceive the evidence to kill his wife, is is there visiting with, with vendors. After he's done visiting with, with the vendors, walks back two minutes and 30 seconds to the, the administration building where his office is, take us to about 11.25 a.m. And so then shortly after that, I'm sorry, so that takes us to about 11.27 a.m., this is the most reasonable time when Jim Van Zandt uh, would have seen Martin leaving to, to pick up Ada. And he said that it was a reasonable time to, to pick up a kindergartner going to half-day school, likely between 11 and 12. He honestly told you he doesn't recall the exact time. He must have been right in that time. Martin then gets in his car and drives a minute 25 seconds down to the American Heritage School, and you heard from Linda Strong. It's interesting, too, that we had to call these timeline witnesses, isn't it, to, to fill it up. The, the state didn't, didn't want to put the whole picture in front of you. So, so we had to call the timeline witnesses, and we, we, we get um, uh, Linda Strong up here, and, and she testifies that, that Martin did, in fact, uh, pick her up. That, that uh, it would have taken her about five minutes to get the kids from the classroom, get their backpacks, get out to the to the area in front of the school. Most of you have kids. You know what it's like picking up on kids at school. Lots of cars there. Reasonable, circumstantially, obviously, to conclude that it would have taken some time. Martin picks up Ada. They drive home, arrive home somewhere around 11.45. Ada goes into the house, as, as uh, she said, and she discovers Michelle in the bathtub. Backing up just a little bit, there was some testimony from, from the EMT, Mark Sanderson, that he thought that Martin said that he had only been gone for 10 minutes. Remember that testimony? He's also the same one that thought that Michelle had on pink sweatpants. Also the same one that thought that it was really odd that, uh, that Michelle would be in the, in the bathtub and, and be wet and then have on dry clothes, so somebody must have dressed her after she was taken out of the, the tub. Remember that testimony? So, 
So that same guy um, thinks that Martin said that, that he'd only been gone for 10 minutes. E even if Martin said it, doesn't work. There, there's no time in, in this timeline that he possibly could have could have been home in between the, the 11 o'clock and 11.30 hour. No time even from the, the 10.40 to 10.50 call that he could have been home. So then we have Ada's testimony. And it's hard to speak six-year-old, I mean, really. But, but things that she says, she saw her mother laying down in the tub. She didn't say she saw her mother sitting up. She said she saw her mother laying down. That's a little, eh, you know, I don't want to try and argue too much weight on Ada's testimony because uh, she's six and, and you heard her, she got a lot of things wrong. Uh, she was talking about walking home from school, talking about Norman taking her to McDonald's first and other things. But I, I point these out just for some examples. She says that her mother was laying down and wetting her hair. Laying down, wetting her hair, that, that seems to be fairly consistent with what, what Martin has always said, that he found her laying down in the tub, face first, with her head in the water. Ada did say, as, as Mr. Mr. Grunander pointed out, that she was all the way in the tub. You know, I, I suspect that probably was Ada's perception. Uh, that doesn't preclude uh, the fact that her feet were sticking out of, of the tub. You know, I, I don't think that, that we can rely 100% on all of the details because children fill in details in their memory of things that, that don't make sense to them. She also says that Dad tries to lift her out. And Dad kept screaming, quick, help. And then she said, Dad told her to, to go to the neighbors and, and get help. So we have this issue with the pants. And the prosecution implied in their closing argument that, well, since Ada said that, that Michelle had pants on, Martin must have removed the, the pants in between the time that Ada left and when the neighbors came back. I can certainly see how they, they were making that argument, but does that make any sense? What difference would that make? Martin had no idea how long it would take for Ada to, to get back with the neighbor when she left the house. Is he really going to be spending time trying to, to get pants off of a wet body that's in the bathtub? Because the prosecution wants to believe sitting down, which would make it even harder to get pants off. It doesn't make sense. The most reasonable conclusion of the evidence is that Ada was mistaken about it. Now, about the top, and, and lifting her out. Uh, Mr. Grunander suggested that why didn't he just get in the tub, you know, like this, and lift her out? If you've got a 182-pound woman in the tub, how are you going to be able to, to get in with, without standing on it? It doesn't make sense. What's the most reasonable conclusion of what somebody would do if they find somebody, as, as Martin described over and over, that uh, she was face down in the tub with her head by the, towards the faucet and just her feet sticking out, and she's, she's in the tub like this, with her face in the water. Are, are you going to leave her face in the water longer and grab her legs and pull her out? Or are you going to, to come down and pull her face out of the water? Well, what's the most reasonable thing to do? You're going to pull her face out of the water, aren't you? That's the most rational thing to do. When you do that, however, and, and roll her over, What's going to happen to, to her legs? Her, her bottom is going to, to go straight down to the bottom of the top. And then you try and lift her out of the tub. And then as you, as you lift her out, where do her feet go? 
right in the tub. That's the most reasonable, rational explanation for, for what happened in relation to the tub. If we go with this the theory that Martin got some of the facts wrong that day, he was certainly in good company. Look at all the other people that, that remember things wrong that day, from the cops to the paramedics to the neighbors. And Martin was hysterical. Martin was in a situation where he was damned if he does and damned if he don't. When he was hysterical, the prosecution's theory is that he was acting and faking and staging the scene. Then at other times when he wasn't hysterical, then the theory is that he was not showing appropriate remorse. How does the guy win? They form their perception, just like the farmer in the fable, and then were unwilling to move from that perception and are willing to cherry pick things that support their perception rather than look at the totality of the evidence. So, they discover Ada, Martin sends Ada to 11.46 to the neighbors. He calls 911, first time at 11.46. That one goes to the county dispatch, and, and then that, that call is dropped. Martin, and as you know from cell phone records, 11.46 could be anywhere from 11.46 uh, and 0 seconds to 11.46 and 59 seconds. And so then, uh, and as you listen to the to the phone call, the 911 call, is, is, which was submitted in evidence, it seems to me that it's, it's about a minute and ten seconds or something like that of conversation in between the, the two dispatch operators, something like that. You, you can listen to it and verify it. But, but uh, we know that um, at 1148, uh, sometime in, in that minute, Martin calls 911 again, and this time it does go to the Pleasant Grove dispatch operator, and we heard Heidi Johnson testify, that call, uh, well, it shows up on the phone records as a three-minute call. Again, that could be anywhere from two minutes to two minutes and 50, 59 seconds, probably closer to two-minute range. And, and probably closer to the 11.48, 50-ish uh, you know, range, too, because the 911 dispatcher called back fairly quickly after Martin hung up. Now, listen to that 911 tape. I think that that 911 tape demonstrates the mindset of Martin McNeil on April 11th. He was hysterical. He was seeking help. He wanted the 911 operator to send an ambulance. And he wanted to get back to, to doing his best to do the best CPR that he could do in the circumstances that he found himself in. And what did the 911 operator want to do? Remember I asked her? She wanted to keep asking him questions because that's their protocol, is to keep him on the phone. And, and you remember Martin finally, he screamed out and he says, why don't you just give me an ambulance or something along those lines? Because he's wanting an ambulance to come for help and she just wants to keep asking him questions. Is there any time in here that he, in theory, could have removed Michelle's pants and maybe, as, as the state wants you to believe, finished her off? I mean, it doesn't make sense. By the time the neighbors get there, sometime between 1152 and 1153, the water's out of the tub, which is consistent with what Martin told the, the 911 operator, that he had left the water out of the tub. Christy Daniels, we know from Doug Daniels' phone records, called Doug at 11.53 after she ran back home to get her phone and then came back. Doug Daniels testified that, that he saw Christy going into the house and that by the time she walked into the bathroom, he was right behind her. The prosecution is making a big deal about um, Martin refusing the woman's offer to, to help get Michelle out of the tub. But Doug was right there. It's not like there was any delay in, in that situation. 
Doug said that he was going back and forth that morning. Uh, Angie Aguilar was in her visiting teaching companion. We're, we're going back and forth in the neighborhood. Yet nobody sees Martin come back home prior to 11 o'clock or between 9.30 and 10.40. And so then after they get uh, Michelle out of the tub, uh, Martin and Christy begin doing CPR with Christy doing the chest compressions. Not Martin, that would be, as Nancy Grace termed it, pumping on the chest. It was Christy. Remember what Nancy Grace said? She said, everybody knows that in a drowning case, as soon as you start pumping on the chest, water starts come gushing out of the mouth and the nose. And what did Dr. Purper say? Absolutely. That's what he said, said then. So Christy's doing compressions, and, uh, and, and Martin's doing breasts, and, and there's, there's no water coming out. And then they switch and Doug takes over compressions and Christy goes out to wait for the ambulance. And, and then Josh Motzinger, uh, Officer Motzinger and Ormond arrive. And uh, Officer Motzinger, uh, he insists that Doug Daniels was the one that met him out in front. Obviously it wasn't Doug because Doug was back doing CPR. Just, just another example of how, when in a stressful situation, people get things wrong. Even kids get things wrong in stressful situations. And then uh, Doug's testimony was that the officer said to keep doing what you're doing while they got their, their stuff ready, the ambu bag. And, and so Doug and Martin continue to, to do it. Uh, they, they see Martin do a precordial thump, which is something that doctors are trained to do. You'll look, as you look in the autopsy, that not only is there no evidence of, of any um, um, damage to the, to the chest from, from a precordial thumb, there, there's no evidence of, of any injury to Michelle's body anywhere other than the plastic surgery incisions and the, the needle marks on her IV and then on each wrist and then in her femoral vein and then in the interosseous line down here. There's no evidence on her body that she's been subject to any sort of abuse. Certainly no evidence that, uh, that she's been forcefully drowned. If you take the state's theory, remember what they, they said just a minute ago in their opening, that, that if Michelle's sitting in the tub, that it's such a small tub that, that she couldn't just nod it off and slump down? Well, similarly, be pretty tough for somebody who's sitting in that tub to be pushed underwater. And if, if we say that she wasn't in the tub, and as they wanted to try and assert draped, where, where are the injuries, either in her chest area or, or under her fingernails or, or her back of her neck or, or in, her, in her mouth? There's no injuries. If she was sitting in the tub, and let's say that she was sitting in the tub and, and you, you could push her under, where are her feet going to go? They're going to go up, right? They're going to come out the, the back of the tub. And if somebody's being drowned, do you think that they're going to be drowned without at least flailing their feet? Look at the flowers. The, the, the scene isn't, isn't disturbed at all. So the prosecution may come back in and say, well, yeah, well, Martin could have staged that, too. You know, if he staged that, you know, we, remember we saw the shampoo bottles were, were down here after they took the picture. If he was staging things, why didn't he take the shampoo bottles out, out too? Alexis testified about a, a rug that was found in the, in the garage that she says was usually in front of the tub by the step. But look at the picture. There's no step here. If you want to look and try and find a step, the best that you could do would be opening the shower door and, and having the ledge here, but there, there's no step in front of her. Uh, and, you know, if the prosecution, you know, this is the last time I get to talk to you, and I'm probably going too long. I'm sorry. I just have so much to say, and hope you'll bear with me, um, and I'll try and, and be short, but, but they get to go last, and so I'm not going to be able to rebut the things that they've saved to to tell you in, in the rebuttal, so, so I, 
I need to anticipate a little bit that, you know, Alexis made some testimony about a rug being out in the garage. Well, that was a, an evolution too. Um, but if, let, let's say that, that um, Martin was supposedly staging the scene and trying to hide evidence of an alleged homicide, is it reasonable that you take it all the way to the garage and leave it there? It's not reasonable, is it? If you're really trying to cover up a homicide, you're going to take evidence where it's not going to be found, rather than where Rachel, as she described as the, the stuff in the ground, all, all this big bloody mess. And then upon further cross-examination, admitted that, well, just a little bit of blood, but she's afraid of blood. The evidence doesn't add up the way the prosecution wants it to add up to support their perspective. This case is full of reasonable doubt. So then um, Chief Sanderson and Dave Thomas arrive somewhere around 1158-ish, and, and they uh, see uh, Officer Monsinger and Ormond uh, doing CPR in the bathroom, and they suggest, and remember, uh, this Officer was it Officer Mossinger or Ormond that said that it was, it was one to two minutes that they did CPR, it seemed like an eternity in the bathroom, and then they, they, they moved Michelle into the bedroom, and, and at that point they switched, and so uh, Officer Ormond then took over doing compressions, and Officer Mossinger then started using the, the AMBU bag. And then sometime in the 11.58-ish to, to 12 o'clock, clockish time when EMTs are setting up, somebody's setting up equipment, that, that's when they say that the, the throwing up incident occurred and that there were two incidents. Dr. Perper testified that somebody who still has, uh, that still has some living functions going on can't throw up, right? We don't know whether she was throwing up due to still having living functions or, or whether it was due to to compressions, but some of the evidence seems to support that it could have been a terminal agonal event, as Dr. Perper put in his original report. They, the first incident occurred while, while um, uh, Officer Monsinger is, is doing the AMBU bag, right? And then they roll her over, and so they're, they're not doing chest compressions anymore. And then Officer Orman says that she throws up again. So that wouldn't be the result of, of water being pushed out of the stomach the second time. Why is that significant? Probably not terribly significant, but it's consistent with, with Officer, not Officer, with Dr. Perper's opinion about the, the time of death. He indicated that he believed that uh, Michelle most likely would have died within an hour of arriving at the hospital, which was 1225. Dr. Van Wagener at the hospital also said that he believed that it's most likely that Michelle would have died within an hour of arriving at the hospital, which was 1225. The EMT said that they wouldn't have worked on Michelle if, if, if it was obvious that she had been dead a long time. The EMTs, paramedics, police officers, none of them noticed lividity. Uh, the uh, uh, Officer Ormond, remember, he said that when he was doing CPR that he noticed um, color coming back into Michelle's face. Another indication that, that probably she hadn't been down very long. And where was, was Martin at 11.25? He was at work. Had been there since. 1040 to 1050 at least, with walking time, would have been you know, somewhere around seven, eight minutes from his house. 23 seconds to walk from the house to the car, and then anywhere from three to five minutes, and depending on which speed Officer Robinson drove to drive from the house to the developmental center, and then a minute and 21 seconds to walk from the parking lot to the, to the medical building, where he could have talked with, with Josette Hardy. Um, so, during the time period when it's most likely that Michelle would have fallen into the tub, Martin couldn't have been there. 
when Ada first found her, she, she saw that the water was, was brownish, consistent with, with blood. If you look at the autopsy photo, only one was, was submitted as relevant, and that shows the injury up on the top of her head, and, and that is bleeding down the side of her, of her head. Again, back to circumstantial evidence that, that actually supports reasonable alternative theories to the prosecution's perspective. The reasonable inference from that evidence is that when Michelle fell in the, in the tub, she very likely did strike her head. And it makes sense if you think about the, the angles and, and where her head could have hit. Does that really make a big difference in the end of the day in the case? I don't think so, but, it, but it's certainly a, an explanation for why she was in the tub and had bleeding coming down the, the side of her head and why Ada perceived the, the tub water to be brown. The Ambu bag. We heard testimony from, from uh, Dr. Van Wagener about how uh, being over aggressive with the Ambu bag can cause injury to the lungs, which tends to go along with, with what happened in this case. Maybe Michelle drowned, and maybe that, the, the blood coming up was due to drowning. Could have been. Maybe it was due to the Ambu bag. Maybe it was due to other causes of death. Both Dr. Gray and Dr. Perper testified that, 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 that the foam is, is not peculiar only to drowning, related to other causes of death, too. And that, in fact, there are, are no um, autopsy findings that are absolutely definitive of, of drowning, although Dr. Perper tried to overstate it with his dilutional theory. So then Michelle arrives at the hospital. Martin continues to be hysterical, says some things that, of course, are odd. The $10,000 comment, I mean, I have no explanation for that other than it's odd. Certainly is not uh, necessarily indicative of, of homicide, much more consistent with a very hysterical man who, who just lost his wife. He uh, may have been living an alternative lifestyle, but he was clearly hysterical at the loss of his wife. And even Rachel admits that in her testimony. Remember, she said that when she first got home, Martin was in the room staring down. When she talked to him, he was crying. And Rachel's email on June 3rd of 2007 that she sends to Alexis when she's getting suspicious about the nanny, which is a little bit different than, than her testimony that we heard in court about when her suspicions arose. In that June 3rd email, she says, I know that dad is suffering because of mom's death. But there's something really weird about this nanny. And then she goes on to list all of the concerns that she has. And so it, if you look at the objective evidence from 2007 again, it seems that it really wasn't until June that Rachel started to have concerns or misgivings about the nanny, and then she writes that email to Alexis asking her about it. I told you a lot of things that you guys already know, and know, and I hope that, that I haven't done, overdone it. Um, but the evidence in, in this case, going back to our, our reasonable doubt chart, I submit to you in, in no way can rise to the level of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Wherever you, you look at it in, in the continuum. And, and, and some of you may have differing opinions uh, as, as to, to the level to which the evidence rises. But based upon a fair evaluation of the evidence in this case, and the credibility issues, it does not rise to this level. The most powerful evidence that, that the state presented to you and what they saved for last were, were the inmates. Inmates who all had an inherent <coughs> motivation to lie. Inmate number, well, let's, let's look at the inmates. 
the two inmates that, that gave testimony that was most, most helpful to the prosecution happened to be the two inmates that were seeking benefit, right? Inmate number one and Jason Poirier. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? The other inmates, um, you, you know, they, they said some things that uh, perhaps supported some of the prosecution's perceptions, at least to the degree of, of, um, of the, the, the bitch comment and, and the notion about um, there being no evidence. But is bitch really an unusual word for inmates to use? Think about it. It's not so unusual. And, and the inmate's testimony comes two to two and a half years after the time that they say that they perceived the events. And these are inmates. What's going to happen to their testimony over that time? It's going to be confusing as to what they really recall, particularly when you factor in their self-benefit portion of it. And then we have inmate number one that we talked about briefly, who, who his testimony seems to, to mirror um, uh, much of, of Alexis's story and, and the Nancy Grace um, stuff about uh, drowning. But then on top of that, th there were numerous times that, that you heard him lie on the stand. Sometimes he would tell a lie, and, and the truth would be in the very next sentence of, of the transcript about the dates. When inmate number one took the stand, the, the, on the second day, he changed his story about when the alleged conversations with Martin occurred and said that they occurred between June and December rather than the first time when it was uh, after December 7th, after the Nancy Grace. Most significantly, uh, well, maybe not most significantly, but also significantly is, is in inmate number one's original interview with the prosecution. They asked him multiple times, so have you ever seen any... Uh, uh, TV shows about this? No. Ever read anything about it? No. Are you sure? You haven't read anything about it? Well, yeah, I guess I did read one article. And what did that say? Well, pretty much the same thing that, that I've told you here today. That's, that's what he said in his interview in May. And then you heard him on the stand today trying to be the number one man in Operation Utah. And he denied seeing anything on the news. Even when his mother is sending him emails about, make sure you watch this. And he wants to portray that he hasn't seen anything. Jason Poirier, you saw from his testimony that, uh, that he, he lies, and he lies, and he lies. And his testimony makes no sense. So he, he arrives in the same area as Martin on December 14th of 2012 after he gets out of classification. And three days later, he uh, sees Martin and says, hey, well, how, how come you get those shoes? Well, because I can get away with things. Like, for example, I killed my wife. So, so a, a man who supposedly got this theory that, that according to the prosecution's theory, that, or he has this ability, according to the prosecution's theory, that he can uh, inject some sort of chemical to to make a, a heart attack occur and, and can stage a, a scene is going to be so stupid that he meets somebody in jail and says, hi, I get away with things like I killed my wife. It, it, it makes no sense. And then two days later, uh, on December 19th, Poirier, not being sure, uh, allegedly, about what was said, uh, goes and, and talks to Martin and says, oh, I'm sorry about your wife. It's all right. I'm glad the bitch is dead, he says. And, and then Poirier says, oh, and I was shooken up real bad. I was, I was shooken up real bad about that. So I was shooken up so bad that I'm going to start sending money to Martin to put on his book so that Martin can give me some commissary because I can't do it myself. I'm going to start sharing poetry with Martin. I'm going to read his, his autobiographies and let him read my stuff. I'm going to have my wife send him care packages, all the while while being so shook up over what was allegedly said. Doesn't make sense, does it? And then on January 7th, Poirier goes to, to court and he finds out that, uh, uh, that he's facing a long time in jail and likely prison on the second offense. And, and, and Martin's confessed to murder. 
It's not credible. Is there a real possibility that the inmates are not telling the truth? Yes, there is. There's a real possibility that they're not telling the truth. Their testimony cannot be a basis to reach this high level of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Their testimony is inconsistent with so much other evidence in the case. You have the medical examiners being inconsistent with each other. We didn't even mention Dr. Craven in here. So we have the three medical examiners that, that are consistent on this. And remember what Dr. Craven said about um, high blood pressure? It's a silent killer. So Dr. Craven doesn't think that myocarditis would have led to death. A well, high blood pressure is the silent killer, just like all three of the other medical examiners. I think I've probably worn out my welcome in front of you. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I talked too long. The, the evidence in this case I submit to you is overwhelming in the sense that it's not credible, that there is an abundance of reasonable doubt. When you get back to the jury room, I certainly hope that, that you'll evaluate the evidence and as, as you review it and consider everything that, that you've heard in, in this case, that, that you will return a verdict of not guilty on both counts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Uh, what I'd like to do is just have you stand, stretch for a couple of minutes, and then the state may engage in